Welcome. I am uh, uh, Hannah Riley Bowles. I'm the co-faculty director of the Women in Public Policy Program uh, with Iris Bonnet, and I have the honor of launching our um, seminar series for this spring semester. Um, uh, here at WAP, uh, where you're kind of being welcomed virtually, um, our mission is to equip leaders and change makers with rigorous evidence-based strategy to advance women and gender equity. And this seminar plays in a very important role in the advancement of our mission by connecting our community members um, with the cutting edge um, of research, um, those people who are generating that uh, rigorous evidence upon which we rely to make the world a better place. The spotlight focus of the gender and public policy seminar for the spring of 2021 um, is a uh, gender and politics. Um, so we're, we have this, we have an incredible slate of speakers lined up um, who will be um, joining us uh, virtually from around the world to, do, to address this important topic of gender and politics. And we are so honored to have as our first speaker in this series, uh, Professor Pippa Norris, who is going to be presenting her work on the state of women's participation and empowerment, uh, new challenges to gender equality. Uh, Professor Norris is the Paul F. McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. She has taught at Harvard for more than a quarter of a century and assembled uh, huge crowds of fans <laughs> for her um, work and insights uh, within and far beyond um, the Kennedy School community. Uh, Professor Norris, just as an indicator, is the fifth most cited uh, political scientist worldwide, according to Google Scholar. She is also a uh, founding director of the Electoral Integrity Project, director of the Global Party Survey, co-director of the TrustGov Project, and, and an executive of the World Value Survey. Um, she has numerous career honors, including the um, very prestigious uh, Skype Prize, uh, the Carl Deutsch Award, um, uh, numerous, I could go on and on and on, but I know you, you all want to hear from her. Um, she has, uh, and it, literally I think it is an innumerable number of publications um, and has thereby accumulated um, several book awards and um, honorary doctorates for the extraordinary influence of the body of her work. Um, on the field, um, and importantly, um, and the insights that she's provided to practice. So we welcome everyone in our WAP podcast community to participate in today's session and in our um, spring uh, uh, semester. Now the podcast community, so we are people who are joining us today live, and then there are people who will be joining us virtually. The podcasts of these, these conversations have been downloaded over um, 59,000 times. Um, so we are, we're grateful to have this lasting and broad reaching impact beyond our uh, live experiences. Uh, Pippa will present for 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes uh, for Q&A with the audience. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk. And those who have a question will have an opportunity to be unmuted to ask your question out loud and Katie is gonna run that process for us. We do ask that any audience questions be brief, be on topic, be posed in the form of a question and actually relate uh, to our presenter's research. Um, so uh, I think we'll, I'll just leave it there. I think that I've, I've fulfilled my part. Please join me in um, welcoming and thanking uh, Professor Norris. Um, and many thanks to all of you who are joining us today. Thank you so much, Hannah. And you know, it's always a pleasure to be part of this because years and years ago, I still remember when we created WAP, as a really important community in Harvard and the Kennedy School, so that we could get together for these sorts of conversations. So it's gone from strength to strength, very much under your leadership and others, uh, and I really welcome everything that's going on. So today what I'm going to talk about is a broad view, and it's designed not actually for academics, it's designed for the United Nations. Every few years the United Nations gets together and thinks about its priorities, in particular we have a meeting of the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, which is coming up uh, next month. And so it's an opportunity for the UN to say what's going on around the world, 
What are the key priorities and how do we move ahead? So I was asked to write this report for them, uh, the expert group that then feeds into, into the um, member states and how they're going to debate this. So that's the context. I'm first going to start with a summary of what the key uh, uh, issues are in this talk. Mention the legal framework, what's been happening in the past, why do we need to expand that? Some evidence, as Hannah says, it's very much evidence-based research, policy research that we're trying to do here. Um, and think through what do we know about a number of different issues of women's empowerment today. Looking at the trends, the emerging threats that I want to emphasize, that essentially we're in a period where many forces are mobilizing, which are going to push back on gender equality, pushing back on women in the workforce, as Hannah knows, pushing back on women's opportunities in political office, and the lessons and recommendations. So here's the summary. Over the years, the UN has met many times. It's always been committed in the broadest sense to women's rights, along with the broad package, of course, of human rights. Ever since it was founded in 1945, that's been a bedrock principle. And you can argue that they've certainly highlighted those issues. And it's been part more recently of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030. The evidence which has mostly been used to monitor this, and the, in particular the proportion of women in elected office, has really focused from 1990, the beginning of the NDGs to date, on the number of women in elected office. And it often shows that there's some increase, which is positive. But what I'm arguing here is that the UN and the status of, of Women Commission really needs to take a br much broader view of what it means to have women's empowerment. Not just women in office, not just women in parliaments, that's important, but it's not enough. We need to think about cultural power. What are the attitudes towards gender equality? Have they moved forward or are they now under threat? Civic engagement. If women are in office, but there's no uh, broader movement which can support them, if women aren't engaged in the grassroots, in all sorts of developments, the sort of thing, of course, which Erica studies, then again, that's a weakness. If they're there in decision making, that's important, but often we focus on the legislature, not the heads of state, where the number of women has really been slow. We can all think of gains, but there haven't necessarily been a broader expansion. And then policy empowerment is the final step, which is to say the issues which reflect women's interests broadly defined. And again, I'm going to argue that some of those have really made progress in the last 30 years, but they're now under threat. So the progress has been uneven, and just like democracy is backsliding, so women's rights and women's equality and women's power may have been backsliding. There are many reasons for this, which I'll mention, and then some recommendations. Now, let's have a think about the actual background for the UN. And we know that every few years, uh, we've got together as an international community. And one of these pictures, by the way, is a very young Hillary Clinton uh, leading the charge from America on these issues. Uh, but uh, ever since uh, Beijing, in particular, when there was a major move forward at Nairobi. Um, so we've had these major shindigs in which the UN has said, OK, what's the status of women? What do we need to improve to highlight these problems? And this is essentially where we are now. These are the SDGs, that's to say the Sustainable Development Goals, everybody has, who works in development knows these. And we've got uh, a wide range of different priorities, but one of those is gender equality, defined as women's empowerment and their full participation on the basis of equality in all spheres of society. So decision-making is not just in politics, obviously, women in management, women in professions, women in, in civic associations, um, uh, and women in, in, in the workplace. All of those are critical. And they're fundamental for the achievement of equality. In other words, it's intrinsically important as part of our goals. It's human rights, women's rights. It's also important, it's argued, instrumentally for development, where women manage to move forward, for example, girls' education, then you get a, a, a growth in the economy, you get fewer, uh, less poverty, you get higher levels of literacy, etc., and peace, it's argued, where women again are in decision-making roles, something which again, WAP has, has spent a lot of time on. So what does it look like if we say what's happening in terms of the SDGs? Quite simply across the world, uh, the Interparliamentary Union keeps track and the snapshot when we look at the indices, the portion of seats held by women in national parliaments, 25% in national governments, a quarter in 2020, more in local government, about a third. Um, so that looks 
is it a glass half full or a glass half empty? Well, certainly that's been um, a great increase. If you look back to 1990, it was about 11% in national parliaments. So that's important. And if we look at the United States, I just updated it for the current Congress and what's happened, 120 women now sitting in Congress. Um, uh, but of course, 27%, which is what it is, is average. It's not that great. There are many, many countries around the world which have gone ahead much further uh, than we have in the United States. So how do we think about this? Is this an important indicator? Well, it is, as I said, I wouldn't dispute it, but we need to think about other types of power. So the first type of power is about the values and norms. Is it accepted that we should go for sex equality in the home, in the workforce, in, in politics? And I am developed a new index for this, which I'll present called the Gender Equality Values Index. And it doesn't mention, it doesn't look at the objective indicators of women in positions of power. Instead, it looks at the attitudes and it's based on the World Value Study done in over a hundred countries. And it combines attitudes towards women's roles in politics and work and education. Secondly, civic participation. So this is about civil society, all the institutions connecting citizens and the states, for example, in parties and how far women are members and active in that, in NGOs and um, all the different social groups and social movements which have been moving ahead, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on Black Lives Matter, whether it's on a wide range of other type of social uh, justice issues and voting turnout. So again, I can create an index of civil empowerment to say what's changed there? Has it moved ahead or are there barriers as well? Thirdly, appointed office and again we can use the national and local legislature and look at the trends over time but also include the courts women in the judiciary and of course at the top heads of government and heads of state and lastly empowerment now empowerment is a difficult measure and conceptually it's the most difficult in some ways because we have to say what is it to have women's quote-unquote interests and of course that can be defined in many different ways uh, depending on different viewpoints different cultures different priorities um, one shouldn't assume that there's only one set of issues, for example, reproductive rights are often defined as policy empowerment, but of course some women are also considerably conservative and against those issues, depending on their culture and traditions. But I'm going to measure two indicators, which I think are pretty good for a universal indicator, rights to property, and that's obviously basic, for example, under divorce and marriage, how far can women have rights to property and then access to justice? Mm -hmm particularly important given the levels of violence against women and other kind of ways in which women have been, um, uh, have problems with um, criminal justice. So four different indicators. And the core argument I made in the paper, which I was trying to get the UN to think about, is that only relying on the third one, i.e. women in, in, in parliaments isn't enough because that in itself can isolate women, women can get into politics. But of course, if the culture is one which does not value their role, then as we've seen right now, uh, if, for example, in, in the recent insurrection, women can experience real violence. This is not just in the United States, but in many countries around the world, think about Afghanistan, women getting into the Winnie Sujurga and being threatened for their lives. And in some cases, um, unfortunately, uh, having not just threats, but acts of violence against them. If there's no empowerment in the culture, then women get isolated. Again, they can get into positions of formal power but they can't necessarily tap into a broader culture. And again, if civic engagement isn't there and policy empowerment isn't there, then it's incomplete. So the UN really needs to rethink some of these ideas. Well, let's look at some of the trends. Do they show progress or do they show some stagnation? So let's start with culture. And it's about the norms. Do people assume that women and men should have equal roles? And here what I've developed is JIVI, uh, gender Equality Values Index. And I've got various items from the World Value Survey that we've conducted now. Essentially, we've included these items from the mid 90s through to the current wave seven, which has got 2020. We're still, by the way, finishing off the field work. I'm part of the World Values team as well. But I use these as part of my book, Rising Tide, years ago, and I still think they work quite well. So it's a simple agree, disagree, uh, four point scale. On the whole, men make better political leaders than women do. When I first looked at that, I said, oh, that's far too naive. Nobody's going to agree with that. Well, it turns out in many cultures, yes, they do. I think men do make a better political leaders than women. We should get out of Cambridge sometime and see what the world is like. Uh, second item, when jobs are scarce, men should have more rights to a job than women. 
And again, that resonates and has really important implications when we think right now about COVID, the implications for women at work and the women back in the home in terms of things like childcare. And then thirdly, education. Again, in the developing world, so critical. A university education is more important for a boy than a girl. And again, think about Afghanistan and if the Taliban come back into power, what's going to happen to all the opportunities which girls have had through expanding education in secondary and primary education and tertiary education as well. And if you don't get that, how are you going to move up to other sorts of careers? So I combine those three items, I create a standardized 100 point scale and I've got 117 societies I can look at with a massive um, half a billion, uh, half a million, I should say, <laughs> uh, number of respondents. What does it look like? Well, first, let's look at the world. And this is how the index varies. So it's color coded for traffic lights. And so you can see, where is it good? Well, surprise, surprise, it's Scandinavia. Um, anybody who looks at any of these indicators always says, well, it's Norway, it's Sweden, etc. Whenever you visit, they say things, oh, it's dreadful here. You know, we only have 80% of women in the workforce, or we only have, uh, you know, 45% uh, of women in parliament. Well, I'm afraid they're great. Uh, and they're scoring very well. Europe, pretty much, Northern Europe, um, France, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, all does quite well. We can see that Latin America has made big progress in these items in terms of gender equality, not quite as high, but still high. America, the United States, I should say, is very similar to Canada and many other countries here, um, and Australia, and of course, um, a few other countries, but look at the other problems. So Russia, and again, Russia made tremendous advances in the Soviet Union for all sorts of areas of women in the workforce. Think about women as physicians or in university education where they achieve parity. But in terms of current attitudes, more traditional. And we can see that there are many other parts of the world which are more traditional. Of course, the MENA region um, in terms of uh, the Middle East and North America, North Africa, and a patchy position in Africa. We don't have as many surveys in Africa as we'd like, uh, but you can see the broad pattern in Asia very mixed indeed, even in a country as advanced as Japan, as we know the culture, attitudes towards women in quality, still very traditional. Now, what are the changes and what's the trends? I think this is really interesting because what I've done here is I've looked at the position and the attitudes towards this gender equality index for women and for men, color coded in the traditional way. And then I've broken it down by region and I've broken it down by the decade in which we carried out the survey. The most important couple of lessons that come out from this, number one, we can see that there has been progress in some regions. Eastern Europe and Central Asia, despite what I said, has moved up in its attitude somewhat. Latin America has made consistent gains. So has post-industrial Western Europe, North America and Australasia. But you can also see that secondly, some, some regions have made uh, no gains or have indeed plateaued um, or, or even gone down. So Asia Pacific, as you can see, is flat and low. Um, and we can see also Sub-Saharan Africa even goes down a bit in the most recent surveys. And again, this goes up to 2020. We're taking each decade and pooling it. And then the third thing to observe is that of course, it's women who are more in favor of gender equality consistently, and that hasn't closed. So you ask about boys' education, you ask about women in politics, and there's a gender gap in all of those attitudes which persists in cultural empowerment, and it's largest in sub-Saharan Africa, which has some of the most traditional cultures. And you can break that down further, for example, um, by uh, levels of income, by education, uh, by predominant religion, you can talk about it in all sorts of ways. But the important point, is there has been some progress, but it hasn't gone worldwide, and the gender gap persists. So men are less in favor of gender equality than women. And if I just summarize again, this the largest gains. This is just some of the countries, Uruguay, Albania, Romania. Now that's important. So it's not just the affluent countries which have become more egalitarian. Um, instead, it's a wide variety of different countries and regions which have moved up in that regard. Um, but of course, some countries have gone down. And here are the cases with minimal change or even losses. India. Now, India, you might have expected women have really been improving their position, high levels of development and growth, especially in, in service uh, in service sectors. But no, in fact, the, the women's 
norms, the idea of gender equality has gone down as it has in neighboring Pakistan, as it has in the Philippines, Nigeria, Bangladesh. So a number of Muslim countries in South Asia and in Africa, again, are leading the decline. And in many other countries, as we see a stability over a long, long period. <laughs> About the same time I've been teaching at Harvard, even in Sweden, of course, no change really. And the last item on just looking at these cultural values is it matters for women's representation. What I've got here is a scatter plot that looks at women in the lower house of the national parliament going on the horizontal axis and also attitudes towards gender equality using my index on the horizontal on the vertical axis. And you can see it's not a perfect pattern. Rwanda, for example, stands out. It adopted really strong gender equality norms and um, laws. And so um, quota laws have really pushed women up in that country in representation, even though attitudes are more traditional. But you can see in general that where there's strong attitudes which are favorable towards gender equality, the Swedens, the Norways, the Denmarks, the Icelands, the Spains, the Germanys, that's where there's a high number of women in office. And contrary to that, if you look in the bottom left hand corner, the countries with the most traditional values are the ones with the fewest women. Whether it's Egypt, which has gone up and down, has now gone down again, Yemen, Mali, um, a democracy that was destabilized, Libya, a, a country which has had tremendous destabilization, uh, Kuwait, Iran, Malaysia, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So culture matters. And imposing quotas, if you don't have gender equality values is a real problem. On the other hand, how you change gender equality is a major challenge. And just to highlight my evidence again, when I look at the number of women in office in the lower chamber and I do a correlation, is it related to democracy? It is. Is it related to quotas? It is. But even stronger, it's mostly related to the culture. And why? Because if you have gender equality attitudes, you pass by and large all sorts of positive actions to try to increase the number of women and voters are not a barrier to women getting elected. Civic empowerment. Now, how do we measure this? This is whether we can influence the policy process indirectly through the intermediary channels. And it's got a number of different measures. Here, what I'm using is varieties of democracy, and they monitor this at national level. And I picked the period from 1920, after the women got the suffrage in many Western societies, through to 2019, the most recent year. And what they measure is the restrictions on women's participation in civil society organizations interest groups, unions, religious organizations, social movements. What does it look like? So here's the trends. And I said, it goes right back. So you have a century of change. And what's the lessons from this? Firstly, there has been a rise in many regions of the world. So civic empowerment, activism through all sorts of social movements, the sort of thing which Erica very carefully documents through protests and demonstrations has gone up in Latin America, just like we observed in the number of women in office. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's gone up. In MENA, in North Africa and in the Middle East, it's gone up. But if you look at the trends just in the last 20 years since the beginning of the 21st century, it's much more of a plateau. It's much flatter. So there's been no real increase despite all of the changes like the Black Lives Matter movement and the mobilization of the Million, million Mum March and all the other things that we've been active on, it doesn't appear that there's been that much growth. And in one case in Asia Pacific, it looks as though there's been a decline. And again, I won't go into this in depth, but you can see here's the gender gaps by region, for example, in political discussion. Now, discussion is a basic way of being engaged. If you can't talk to people about politics, your neighbors, your friends, your work colleagues, then, then there's a problem. And this isn't about laws, it's about are you interested or, or are you aware or do you have knowledge? And again, the gender gaps continue. Men talk about politics much more than women. And again, we can see the gaps are biggest in the MENA region and Sub-Saharan Africa, where in Sub-Saharan Africa, the gap's even grown a bit. In other countries, we can see it's gone down in, in Eastern Europe following uh, uh, the opening of the region. And we can see it, it's gone up a bit in, in Western Europe. So it's somewhat varied regional trends. So years ago, I wrote this book, Rising Tide. And I looked at the trends then and I said, worldwide women 
aren't as engaged in interpersonal communication with their family about politics, they're not as interested, and it appears that gender gap has not closed over time. That's pretty sobering for me. That's pretty important. If you, if you aren't even going to talk about politics, how can you even get engaged in the broader deliberative process? And here's another indicator. This is about attending peaceful demonstrations. And again, one of the major ways that we mobilize is to have um, all sorts of uh, peaceful protests, not the insurrection protests, but those which are basically just uh, demanding our rights, raising issues on the policy agenda. And again, you can see that there have been changes over time, but they're inconsistent across regions. And again, men are more willing to engage according to the World Value Survey in peaceful demonstrations than women are. And there's a decline of participation in some places, a rise in others or a flatness, it doesn't matter. The gender gap seems to persist in nearly every region. So what about decision-making? That's at the top of the apex. That's, as we said, women in politics, but also as heads of state, as ju judiciaries in courts and senior civil servants, managers um, in that regard in the public sector. Here, there has been more progress, uh, but there are interesting patterns by region. Um, and so in Latin America, I think it's really a record of, of, of considerable success uh, where women over the time, this is from the 1920s, so it's a whole century of change, were very marginalized in the interwar period. They started to increase and then they rapidly increased roughly from the 1990s onwards. That was when many countries started with Latin America, starting with Argentina, introduced gender quotas. And we can see that the number of women in, in public life has gone up rapidly, again, from an earlier period, basically from the th uh, second wave women's movement of the early 70s in post-industrial societies. But it's also gone up more recently in the Middle East, in Asia Pacific, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously, Eastern Europe is the exception. And that is the impact of 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the changes in democracy, when, of course, in the first initial period, quotas were abandoned. I wrote a report for the OSCE about this and what could be done. Quotas are very unpopular because they were seen as part of the Communist Party, where women were brought into office, but they were not empowered. But since then, there have been moves in many parts of the region to restore some of those or at least provide other forms of activity, uh, voluntary quotas, for example, in parties that has restored somewhat the position of women. Now, in Beijing, Remember the target was a third. That was what we said, that, um, by, uh, that, the, that essentially every parliament should have 30% women. It was, a, it was a kind of mythical target. It was not a real target. They kind of made it up on the spot, but it was a target. And we can see that uh, most regions are still not there. They're still struggling. So progress, yes, but it's going to be a long time before we end up with women's uh, achieving Beijing or getting, 52% to reflect their population. That's not even on my chart. I notice it goes up to 40%. It should go up to 50% anyway. And gender quota laws, that's the reason. Here's the trends, nothing much going on in right throughout the period, but they really took off. 1990 was critical and everybody started to talk about gender quota laws. Mona Lena Crook has done a lot of great work on this and how they spread around the world. And the UN played a big role in encouraging countries when they're introducing new electoral laws and party laws to introduce also gender equality, even in traditional cultures. And again, I was involved a little bit in that in the active constitutional process in Iraq and in Afghanistan, where traditional societies said, this is something which the UN has championed women's equality. And it's something which we're setting up a new parliament, we can do this. But Look at where gender quota laws are weakest, and this is also really interesting. It's the post-industrial established democracies. Why is that? Because many of these already had voluntary um, affirmative action processes, um, and they didn't introduce laws, unlike in Latin America, where, as you can see, it just takes off like a, a rocket. But the limit of this is that, yes, women are getting into the legislatures, and they're getting in through laws, not through cultural change as we've observed, that doesn't necessarily mean empowerment. And we've recently started to revise the review, the view that gender quota laws and women's equality is necessarily accompanied by women's empowerment because in many countries, 
there have been women appointed in parties to support the regime, to support the party leader, but not necessarily to have any real power in order to change the agenda, to speak up about their concerns, or indeed to advance uh, a broader feminist agenda. And this shows you that the number of women in, in, the, in the national parliaments now, now, the percentage in the most recent period, is not predicted by the Liberal Democracy Index. So it's a more complex pattern than we were thinking about, I think, 20 years ago. You can have countries which are not very democratic, which have a higher proportion of women in office, and you can have countries which are very democratic by many standards, which have a, a lower proportion. And heads of government, I know we're all thinking about Kamala Harris and we're thinking about um, Jacinda Ardern and many other women around the world who have come up to top leadership positions. But let's get real, look at the proportions and we can see that this is the proportion of women as heads of government and heads of state. Now it may be symbolic or it may be substantive, um, but nevertheless, this is the average. And we can see the, uh, the indicators which are, which are here. So heads of state are more symbolic. Heads of, heads of government are the more real um, office holders in many ways who are, actually have power. And again, Latin America, great. I can celebrate Latin America, not so much in most other parts of the world. And a mixed pattern um, in terms of, um, again, post-industrial societies. So what about policy empowerment, the fourth dimension? And then we can break off and think about some questions and Q&A. Now, this is about policy, po policy outputs and policy, not outcomes, but policy outputs. In other words, are there laws which respect women's rights? And I've chosen the ones on, as I said, property. So freedom of domestic movement, the right to private property, freedom from forced labor and access to justice. And again, this is from VDEM and it's a century worth of change. And what you can see is that there has been some increase in women's rights in policy terms, but in the last 30 decade, years or decade, last three decades or 30 years, what you can see is it's often kind of plateaued. There hasn't been tremendous increases in Eastern Europe, it's plateaued in Latin America, it hasn't really gone up, unlike the other charts. In, in Western Europe, it hasn't changed that much, and in Sub Saharan Africa, it's flat, and Asia Pacific. So getting women into office, absolutely. We're not going to dispute that. Celebrate it when we can. Does it mean women's empowerment? This is only one measure. And we can think of many other measures. We can think of reproductive rights. We can think of women's health care. We can think of um, uh, women's pay and legislation and equal rights, etc., etc. You can use all sorts of indicators. But this suggests reasons for caution. And the last thing I'll mention is that there are emerging threats. I won't go into this in depth because I know, Katie, we don't have a lot of time, right? How much more time? You have about nine more minutes to speak. So, oh, okay. yeah, dealer's choice on what, um, if you want to open up Q&A earlier, if you want to keep on plowing ahead, whatever works for you. Okay, well, I'll mention the emerging threats, which are a bit more pessimistic, and then open this up. Here's some of the challenges. We've said glacial advances in cultural values. And in particular, what we've seen most recently, not just in the United States and not just in Europe, but in many parts of the world, is the revival of social conservatism. who have a very clear anti-gender social movements. It's not just the, uh, the extreme white supremacists, the militia and the quote unquote patriots groups, but many other groups who are hate groups, who are very active in Europe, for example, in Germany and in France and in Italy, are really trying to push back. And in particular, what we can see in, is in Central and Eastern Europe, gains for authoritarian parties and leaders, which have threatened or actually rolled back gains for women's rights. So I'm speaking in particular of cases like Hungary, Viktor Orban, and the pressures that he's put on women, Poland and reproductive rights, where they've tried to push back on a very Catholic country, they've tried to push back on women's rights to abortion, um, threats in both of those countries to gay rights and to uh, LGBTQ rights, um, uh, uh, for example, recognizing transgender rights. And we can see 
uh, and I won't go into the reasons for this, but it's part of my larger book, which I've done with Ron Inglehart, the rise of authoritarian populists as part of their philosophy, their values, their ideas, is to essentially be against gender equality in the home, in marriage, in the family, in the workforce, along with being uh, against many other progressive forms of change, whether it's environmentalism, or whether it's issues of multiculturalism, whether it's issues of multilateral relations, um, uh, or many other progressive changes. So those gains, as parties and leaders have moved into office, they've come and they've gained parliamentary power, and they've gained office sometimes in, um, also in, um, in cabinet, in shared, in shared power sharing agreements, that threatens to roll back gains for women's rights. And again, in America, for those of us here, you'll have noticed the tremendous difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, where Joe Biden has really emphasized not just diversity within the cabinet, which is important as a symbolic way of in increasing women's visibility and roles, but also how he's emphasized women's rights and issues like reproductive rights as part of his initial executive office, um, executive office uh, announcements and initiatives. Fourthly, these threats have exacerbated threats of acts of violence. And the United Nations and UN Women and many other international agencies have now recognized that. It used to be seen as somewhat peripheral or somewhat in the private sphere. But now increasingly we recognize that women are not going to have a voice, are not going to be able to stand in office, are not going to be able to exercise leadership when they're under threats of violence. Ironically, given the current debate right now in Congress, sometimes threats of acts of violence against women in leadership positions from other women who are also in leadership positions. So we, uh, anyway, Mona Lena Crook again, one of my colleagues at Rutgers um, has emphasized this and got a brand new book on, on this, but the international community in general has really stepped up. A lot of this is on social media, that's exacerbated the threats, but it isn't confined to that. And it's not just threats, it's also real acts of violence against women. Um, as, we, as we know. And of course, the fifth threat, or the fifth emerging challenge, is COVID. And there have been many reports about the ways in which we can vulnerable populations and reverse gains for girls in schools, of course, and of course, for women in paid employment, particularly those with childcare or uh, care of the elderly responsibilities. It's also heightened the risks of domestic violence as women's been confined to the home versus the public sphere. And it sidelined parliaments who haven't been able to meet or debate or deliberate. It's postponed elections. International idea has, has documented that. It's undermined democracy because the executive has often been in charge of the initial response. And they've said that essentially um, that many of the draconian measures they've taken have been in order to improve our health security, but it has also knock on consequences by weakening human rights and women's rights. I'll finish off here uh, with one more slide. This just shows you how the parties have advanced. This is from my global party survey. And I ask in over a thousand parties around the world where you'd place, I ask our experts, where you'd place the parties in 21 different dimensions. And one of the dimensions is, do parties favor liberal or conservative social values on many different issues, as you can see from the question, for example, abortion rights, same-sex marriage, democratic participation, that's liberal, conservatives reject these ideas. And then also we can see how far parties favor or oppose women's rights. And if you look at the top right quadrant, you'll find many of the authoritarian populist parties I mentioned earlier. Here is where you'll find the Austrian Freedom Party. Here is where you'll find Erdogan for Turkey. You'll find Orban for Fidesz in Hungary. You'll find Spain and Vox. You'll find parties in France, the French National, uh, 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 National Rally now, or otherwise previously the um, National Front. You'll find UKIP in the United Kingdom and Brexit. You'll find parties in Slovenia, Slovakia, um, in Switzerland, in many countries around the world. So these are the parties which have been gaining power. These are the parties which are opposing women's rights 
and socially conservative in their values. By contrast, oh, and by the way, I should mention that um, the GOP is up there. And unfortunately under Trump, but I think in many ways continuing in its current form, it's become very authoritarian populist and very anti-women's rights and anti-women's equality. Down in the opposite quadrant, you'll see many of the standard social democratic liberal parties, which are pluralist in values and often green parties are there, but also um, socialist parties, um, people's parties, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many parties are still liberal and pluralist and in favor of gender equality, of, of course. And you'll also find the, um, the I should have highlighted it, uh, but the um, Democratic Party in the United States is also within that group, along with the Canadian Liberals and uh, the British Greens and et cetera, et cetera. So the parties who advanced who are against this were under threat. So what do we do? Here are three ways to, to um, here three three things we might want to think about. Maybe we need another World Congress. Now a World Congress, when this was discussed in the expert meeting, people said, look, that's risky, it's dangerous. In particular, so many parties and member states have become so much more conservative. If you had a World Congress, they could push back because they'll be attending. You'll have representatives there from Saudi Arabia, you'll have representatives there from, um, from Russia and from many of the countries where women's rights have been under threat. So it is a, a risky strategy. On the other hand, it's also a way to highlight the problems and the challenges and to bring the world's attention to this. Secondly, and I think this is more doable, we can monitor what we're using as evidence. The SDGs, as I mentioned, are great, but they're limited. And we need to work with national statistical offices in each country to develop multi-dimensional monitoring indices of women's equality. Uh, and we can all do this as scholars. We can all do this as social movements. We can all do democratic, uh, sorry, audits on gender equality in our country. There are many ways of doing this, but it has to be sex segregated in ways that often data is not at present. We've seen, for example, on the indicators of race and vaccinations, um, that that's a, a, a critical issue. Only 22 states in America have monitored the racial composition of those who get vaccines. Well, what about gender? And that applies to many standard indicators that we need to keep a, a, a very close eye on. Lastly, we need to have some agenda setting and in particular the impact of COVID-19. And the UN Women has produced already a couple of reports, but I think that's an area for tremendous research. So for all the colleagues who, who are with us today, I would certainly say if there's any areas that you might want to think about for a PAE or for your own research, then thinking about the broader ramifications of not just the short-term impact, impact of COVID, but the long-term impact. If girls can't go to school, what does that do for educational gains? If women are in the long term using electronic me mechanisms from home, not the office, is that good or bad? Well, there are some advantages, there are many disadvantages for women's um, uh, public in the public sphere. And in particular, again, the threats of violence, how they got worse. And what does this mean for women's empowerment? So a big agenda, three things. Um, I very much doubt if the UN will do many of these, but it's something that we can all contribute towards if we're concerned about these issues. And I really look forward to learning your views and ideas and suggestions and feedback from this. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pippa. I really appreciate it. So now we'll go into the Q&A. If you have a question, the best way for me to know you have a question so I can unmute you is to go down to the participant tab and hit the little uh, blue icon that says raise hand. That will help us establish our line of people who have questions and I will then unmute you from that. And Katie, could I suggest you take, say, two or three questions as a cluster to maximize it, and then we have a QA? and a I mean, yes, then of course. Of course, all. great. So I see Hannah Riley Bowles and Amal Elsana have both raised their hands. So Hannah, I'll unmute you first, and then we'll go to Amal. Am I? Yeah. Hi, Pippa. Thank you. Brilliant, as usual, eye-opening. Um, 
I uh, a couple of um, a couple of thoughts. So greedily, I'm going to cue two thoughts if you can if we can hear from both. So so one is um, I'm I'm very interested in how you cross you create like uh, cross perspectives on different measures. But I'm wondering if you've thought about these from a lagged perspective and just trying to hold the different graphs in my head. It seems like you know, that we had that classic finding from Rohini Panda and Esther Duflo showing that these, you know, women, you know, 10 years after these women were randomly assigned to running the councils, that's when you saw attitude change. But if it seems like you might be seeing some positive attitude change and some reactants, which is, I think, what you're in. I'm wondering if you've looked at them from a lagged perspective. And then finally, I'm just inspired by your forward looking thinking. So if, if there's any, any more thoughts we can hear from you on that, particularly in relation to the pandemic and how we come out of the um, I would be grateful. And I'd love your thoughts as well about what particularly the international community can do to respond on that. Wonderful, great. And Amal, I'll uh, ask you to unmute now. Okay, uh, thank you very much. This is a great presentation and very comprehensive. And I have two questions and I will try to make them very uh, concise and quick. Uh, so the first one, uh, do you see um, a, rela a direct relationship between uh, colonialism, poverty, and women's rights, uh, especially uh, when we talk about uh, cultural uh, values? Because I myself is coming from a Bedouin community in the south of Israel. I'm a Palestinian, and I have been working on women issues for the last 25 years. And I absolutely agree with you in the issue of the cultural value, because I think whatever we do, if it's not going to address these issues, that the women status will remain uh, as uh, one of the challenging issue, issues that we are facing. The second question is that I do see uh, the, the gain and the, um, the increase in, in women's civic engagement. But my really question is, is why can't we, and what is it that we are not able to translate this massive civic engagement that we have as women into political power? What is it that we are missing from the communal level to the political level? What is it that we are not doing to translate this community engagement and civic engagement into political power? Thank you. Good, thank you, Ma. So, so there's a few more, there's three more people in the queue, Pippa. Do you want to take those questions and then we'll do another round? Let, uh, so you'd like me to address those two? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so Hannah, absolutely, lagged, lagged indicators. I mean, it's not going to change overnight, that's clear. We need to think through, for example, when women enter the US Congress, they have to work their way up through the committee seniority system, they have to work their way up through the senior leadership, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, you can also say, what are those rules of the game that delay uh, those processes. So the seniority rule in the US Congress in particular is not set in stone. Many other places might have other criteria and having a greater diversity of young members from all diversities um, engaged in the senior in, in the in the leadership of the parties and in the leadership of Congress would seem to me a major. I mean, I'm amazed how we're, we're turning in America in particular into a um, into a, a, an aging uh, group who really have a grip on politics in, in ways which are totally inappropriate. I really want the younger generation to get engaged. I think they're the new blood and they're the people who can lead us forward. So all of these things are changes which are, they take time to go quote unquote through the classic cliche of the pipeline, right? But on the other hand, we also need to focus on the here and now and say, where are we now? And also project it forward, not just go back. So we need to say, if we were to take those trends as you've seen on those each of those regions and 10, 20 years from now, where are we going to be? And I think that's also illuminating. The fact that, for example, I'm afraid, Hannah, that you and I are probably going to be dead before we actually see 50% of women average worldwide in, in, in parliaments um, is a bit sobering. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, even though some countries go up quite a bit. So thinking about the lags and thinking about the interactions of each of those four elements, I want to pull them apart. I don't just want to smush them into one kind of standard indicator, because I think they're each different dimensions with their own dynamics and different ways we can intervene, different actors involved, different structures of opportunity, right? Um, and so if one is blocked, maybe you can work on another. 
Um, but I do think in, in the ultimate way, the way I'm saying it is that these four things do, do interact in important ways. And that's how I've kind of structured it. Culture is the base, it's the broadest thing, it's the most difficult to change, but it's certainly absolutely critical because it's everybody. Um, civic activists are always going to be a minority. I'm just writing a new paper on that. And you know, the number of people who get engaged in demonstrations worldwide has gone up, but it's always a small group. People who get into office is an even more of an elite. And then policy outcomes, um, you know, that's, that's a, a very narrow area. So you can think of it like an upside down triangle and we can work on culture, we can work on intermediary, we can work on elites and then we can work on outcomes. They do all interact, but they are separate, um, I think. And, and that's really important. So in, in a country, if you can't work on one, you can work on another. It's the opportunities that open where there's a window where you can really make gains. So in some countries, you might have gender quotas in parliament, you suddenly get women as candidates, but in others, you get issues where women can really push as civil society groups or um, in terms of other kind of initiatives. Um, Amal, um, the issue of, of how these things relate is of course incredibly complex in the Middle East and especially in Palestine, um, where women have made some gains, but of course the broader structural inequalities are so severe. Um, so how do you translate the women's movements and the immense mobilization through philanthropic groups and through charitable groups and through social community groups into real power? And of course, for me, the answer in terms of the um, in terms of Palestine has to be constitutional change in general and uh, and political change. If you don't get the structures right, then clearly there are blockages in in the system. But the broader answer, I'd say, Amal, is also about responsiveness of political institutions. Who do they listen to? How much are women able to channel their concerns into the legislature? And that is a matter which again is about constitutional reforms. I believe in institutions. I believe that you change behaviors by changing the rules of the game. So if you do that, um, and I won't go into the, the detail about, about that, but for example, in parliaments, we don't just have to like getting women into management, get women in, we then need to say, how does the parliament work? What are the rules which are unwritten or written? And how do they prevent women actually asserting their voice in ways, simple things, is most business done through committees or on the floor in big debates? If it's on debates, then men tend to be beneficial from that because they often rather like uh, the sound of their own voice and things like that. If it's in committees, that's often where women in fact are more comfortable and play a bigger role. So change the rules, push more legislation through committees versus broad plenary debates, and you're empowering all sorts of groups who might otherwise feel um, disempowered through that. Those are my kind of broad, um, broad thoughts anyway. Katie, we've got some good people coming in, so let's hear from yes, thanks oh, so much. Eric has put a hand down. No, no. Oh yeah, your hand is up, great. No, it's still there. Great, so we have June Marie, then Erica, and then Gabrielle. June Marie, I'm gonna ask you to unmute now. Great. Thank you. So two questions. One is for organizations that have ECOSOC status, we have a limited amount of requests or inputs and feedback that we can give to the Economic and Social Council at CSW. I yeah. would like to know what your recommendations, what, if you have any succinct points that would definitely need to be included. Second question is, we're always pushing for this disaggregate data and them to for you know more uh, granular sorts of in, um, I, data, and I'm wondering when we have these this issue where we've seen pushback on gender in general and gender binary language and all of that. Like how how do we how do we have that conversation? How do we advance that the idea of uh, getting this data, but also challenging the the gender binary? Thanks for that, Erica. I'll unmute you now. Yeah, um, thank you so much to everybody who made this uh, possible. And thanks a lot, Pippa. This was really. Oh, apologies, Erica. I was trying to mute the past, the last question asker and I accidentally muted you. OK, so yeah. sorry. Thank you were making such a good point, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Pippa. This is really great. Um, I have uh, two questions and I guess a related comment to what Amal uh, was talking about. So um, the first thing is that what struck me is that 
the trends in, in um, the Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa on the, the decline um, in, I think, cultural attitudes uh, that were kind of gender uh, inclusive. And it made me wonder whether um, uh, this was a function of really backlash against kind of coordinated development policies that um, encourage gender inclusive uh, sustainable development um, and, and uh, whether that is actually, you know, one of these much noted um, uh, kind of reactions uh, to like, you know, what is often considered to be a Western um, kind of uh, policy idea um, or do you think that this is more evidence of effective counter mobilization um, mm -hmm. in those regions by uh, more conservative parties or groups? Um, right. And then related to that is, is what really struck me is um, how much of the sort of backlash and, and retrenchment is happening across multiple countries at the same time. And so when I see that, I think, you know, authoritarian patriarchal wave, a global wave, right? Um, and um, you know, related to that, it, it brings up this question of, are we really looking at certain countries that are sort of locked into these patterns, or are we looking at a, a really kind of coordinated global wave of autocratic patriarchs um, that are quite coordinated, quite sophisticated, and have sort of managed to pull off this global kind of authoritarian populist response to the various crises around the world and have a highly kind of patriarchal, homophobic, ethnocentrist or racist approach right. um, governance that for whatever reason is appealing, right? So, so can you just kind of speak to the, the global moment and the nature of the kind of co-variation of these trends across uh, different countries? And then my last um, comment really more than anything is that it's, I think related to, to the two that came before, which is, you know, life in China today is quite different for women um, who are Han versus Uyghur versus Tibetan versus other uh, ethnicities. And, and, um, and it's, it's especially different if, if they also happen to be queer or um, you know, uh, gender non-conforming. And so I think this is very much um, encouraging the, the sort of sex segregated data, but also encouraging um, you know, attention to these more um, overlapping identities that, um, that really do create different policy challenges for women who are situated in different parts of the society. And you know, to, to the sort of fifth world conference, which I hope gets to happen, I would hope that, um, you know, it would have this kind of intersectional attention, even though this is like politically the, the, the antichrist of the, you know, populist autocrat patriarchs, right? So, so like, how do we pull this off and like bring up to date um, the knowledge that, that feminist um, and queer scholars have been able to develop um, while also attending to the political realities of this global moment? Great point. Thank you so much. So I know we have another question in the queue, but we are at time. So I want to I, I want to send my apologies to Gabrielle and give Pippa a chance to respond. I'm um, respecting everyone's time here as much as possible. Gabrielle, do come back on email, right? So we can chit chat that way because I really love your, your thoughts as well. So thanks everybody. Jim Marie, EcoSoc, what can we do? Well, I think that there is a political barrier to having multi-dimensional indicators and having granular data which is broken down and the blockage is quite simple when I, I, I speak partly from my hat on when I was at the UNDP I headed up the democratic governance group for a couple of years and I always found that the problem was that simply government statistical offices wanted to control the statistics going into the United Nations for all sorts of sometimes good reasons because they want to make sure that it's kosher that it doesn't have political biases that it's not from some weird old think tank that just creates something which is not reliable so for good statistical reasons they need that. But the problem is there's so much data out there that they're not using as a result, which is meeting the highest scientific standards that we have. And I'm obviously a bit of an advocate for the World Value Survey, but we've been going now since the 1980s. We've covered over 100 societies around the world. Everything there can be broken down by ethnicity, by race, by gender, by, um, by, by region by rural, urban, educated, non-educated, rich, poor. We have even the Afrobarometer measure of lived poverty. We have so much there. We go to the United Nations on a number, and I've been there on a number of occasions to have these dialogues and to say, can we not help? It's not, you don't have to spend a dime. You have to be able to use this data in your own reports. So that if you want to look at these issues, then you can, 
And this partly addresses Erica's point about the ethnicity of, of all of these issues. And yet every time we come up against the fact the governments want to control the data and therefore their statistical officers want to control it, because information is power. Uh, so it's not just about technicalities, it's not just about money, it's not just about collecting the data. We have, I have data coming out my whatever, um, and it's great data, but I can only use this as a scholar, I can only use this as a civil society participant. I, uh, every time it gets rejected, as soon as you try to put it into a report. Simple example, when I joined the UNDP, uh, there was a big kerfuffle because they could not put in the Freedom House or the Policy Measure of Democracy as part of their Human Development Report. That created so much backlash. Every country is democratic in its own way, right? So you can't have an external agency, even though they've done it for years and years, evaluating democracy. And I'm afraid, um, despite everything, that seems to be still the case, even though they're a great forum to bring these statistical offices in, in conjunction with academic who create these data sets, but it's still problematic. Um, just the last point, because I know we have no time. Uh, which one should I? Uh, so that's the ECOSOC and the idea of intersectionality and so on. Um, what's going on with the threats and the coordinated threats? And this, I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm sorry, Erica, you have to buy my book um, and read the book uh, because it's a big argument. And in a nutshell, what it says is look, societies have become more diverse. We know that in all sorts of ways, in terms of sexuality and gender identities, in terms of urbanization in terms of ethnicities and cultures. That has been a rising tide of liberalism in most of the attitudes that are progressive. Take basic attitudes of tolerance of homosexuality and the World Value Study and everything else, it goes up. In, Europe, in America, it goes up. In Europe, it goes up. Same is true of many other indicators. Problem is that that has threatened. When it was still a small minority in the 70s who believed in these progressive liberal values, the educated, the graduate students, etc. then they weren't a major threat. But as they've in, expanded through generational change, that liberal group has moved from a 30% to a 40% to a 50% in many societies. And what that means is that those who are socially conservative, who believe in patriotism versus internationalism, who believe in marriage versus gender fluidity, who believe in um, issues of, of, of gender uh, divisions of sex, sex uh, of sexual divisions of labor versus um, a fluidity there they feel under threat and it's not that they're just being taught that they're under threat it's not just that social media and leaders are telling them that they are under threat they're becoming the new minority they haven't yet however abandoned politics this many of these groups still vote at high levels younger generations who are more liberal don't vote a consistent pattern in every place and in addition, they've become increasingly resentful and angry that what they thought were the values of their own country, whether it's Britain or whether it's America or whether it's Germany or France, what they thought were the values which they grew up with and which are still the values of their community often are not the values which they see in the media. They're not the values they see certainly in elite institutions like Harvard. They're not the values which they see in representation. So that group is angry, they're mobilized. And it's a tipping point argument. As that group moves from, from the 70% of Americans through to the 50% through to the 45%, which is roughly where the proportion was that supported Trump, then they're losing their status and power and they're not going down quietly. Meanwhile, the fact that they're angry has made the progressives angry, of course, because they thought everything was going fine under Obama and to find it all got knocked back under Trump. Now, as you move along with generational changes, our prediction is that as you move into the, where that group becomes the, the clearer minority, it's the older generation, it's the less educated, it's rural, they become the 30% of the population. So that anger will somewhat diminish, partly because they realize society has changed. And there's kind of a spiral of silence to use the Noel Newman concept. You don't speak up if you feel that that, but when you feel the majority and you're not being represented, then you feel angry. So it's a big argument, but that's our broad thing. And it's not, it's not really coordination. It's more that social changes are happening across the world, especially in affluent post-industrial societies. Hence, you get similar political manifestations of those groups in, in many countries around the world. It's like a coordinating effect. But that's what's going on with cultural backlash. That's why we wrote the book. Um, and that, I think, is, it captures 
what's happening in America, but it also captures many other societies from their own experience as well, I think. And the long-term liberalism is basically the arc of history, as Obama used to say. In the short term, we're in the battlefield. The culture wars have intensified. Economics, by the way, is less important than it was. It is these issues which are making people angry in our views. It's race, it's ethnicity, it's multiculturalism. It's a whole bunch of things which threaten people's identities. And threatening identities is problematic. Anyway, that's my concluding. Thank you. We are so grateful. You're, you're giving us a kind of inspiration and clarity to hold on to that longer perspective, no matter how turbulent uh, the flight feels right now. We're extremely grateful for your thought leadership. We are enormously grateful to all of the participants in this seminar for the rich discussion. We hope you will continue to join us for this conversation of gender and politics and keep pushing uh, to Erica's point, the intersectional lens, which is so critical to understanding uh, gender inequality and gender and inequality. Mm -hmm.